now from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. Last night here on CBS 4, we aired an hour long special called Everglades, where money, politics and race collide. Now, if you missed it, you can watch it online by going to cbsmiami.com backslash Everglades. And even if you did watch last night, there's a lot more additional information on the website, so you may want to visit it. Now, this morning, we're going to highlight parts of the special where I trace the origins of the toxic algae bloom that hit the Treasure Coast last year. And I talk about Everglades restoration, all issues that affect everyone living in South Florida. Here's a part of last night's special. Here, Gator, 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 Gator. Marshall Jones grew up in the Everglades. His great grandfather started this fishing camp in 1932. The Everglades has sustained my family for five generations. Growing up as, as a boy, the Everglades was my playground. I'm a family man. I have four amazing children, and I want them to see the same Everglades as I grew up with, or better. If the start of 2016 had heavier than expected rains, the start of 2017 saw the glades facing a drought. When that happens, the vast majority of the wildlife uh, here dies. Uh, they have nothing left to feed on, and there's nothing left for them to survive in. Jones took us to a spot where gators and fish were able to find water, and it is not just the wildlife that's affected. If there's no standing water within the river of grass, the aquifer is not being replenished. In other words, we can endanger our own drinking water, because if there isn't fresh water filling the aquifer, then salt water from the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico will push its way in, not only killing the seagrass and fish nurseries in Florida Bay, but eventually winding up in the aquifer. When that happens, we have a major problem. The water can't be used for regular tap water, and it can also no longer be used to water lawns or water our fields to the south here in, in, in Homestead and the Redlands. Now, we'll play more of our special throughout today's show, but let's bring in this morning's guest. Jenny Stiletovich covers the environmental issues for the Miami Herald, and Michael Grunwald is a writer with Politico, and he's also the author of the book, The Swamp, which examined Everglades history and restoration efforts. I want to thank you both for coming in. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate the fact that you both sat through and watched uh, the <laughs> special. It was uh, awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thank Everybody you very much. Uh, but I, I want to just start with the, with the sort of the overall overriding question, which is, you know, why should people care about the Everglades? A lot of people don't even visit the Everglades. They see it as some place where you go and get really bad mosquito bites. But, you know, the person that we saw there a second ago from Max Fish Camp, he sort of began to explain it. Michael, why should we care about what goes on in the Everglades? Well, here are, here are like three quick reasons, right? One is that it really is this, this international treasure. There are no other Everglades on Earth, and it's just an amazing place. There's nothing else like it. Um, it's right in our backyard. Um, it's really one of the things that makes Florida Florida. Um, but also, as you suggested, the, basically the Florida economy depends on the Everglades because the water sitting underneath the Everglades is really our drinking water for South Florida. Without it, we can't have development. Without it, we can't have agriculture. Um, and then the third reason is that really, I mean, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas said that the Everglades is a test. If we pass, we may get to keep the planet. And we have, right going on right here in our backyards, the largest environmental restoration project in the history of the planet and uh, you know we're gonna see whether we can have a civilization sitting right next to this natural treasure we're spending 20 billion dollars and the world is watching to see whether we get it right Jenny when when you sort of go about writing about environmental issues but particularly mm -hmm. the Everglades do you find it a little challenging that you have to present things in a way to try to draw readers in yes like you said a lot of people have never been there before so trying to it's the, it, the Everglades have this sort of minimal view and describing that in words can sometimes be a challenge. It's Tell more a feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's very difficult to kind of engage people on that level. It's easier when you tell them you will have no drinking water. <laughs> that they kind of get. But getting, but the sense of beauty out there is it's stunning. I mean, you've been. I always, there. I always it's say really it's, it's less ooh and ah than hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, just a little bit about our path on, on how we started with this. Last year, we obviously had 
that incredible blue-green toxic algae crisis in the Treasure Coast. And that and that's really start, formed the basis for what I started trying to explore. And you start working through that issue, that, that algae crisis that shut down beaches and businesses and had a terrible effect on the economy and may have long-term health effects as well. And you start realizing how interrelated everything is. The algae crisis then takes you to understanding about Lake Okeechobee and how phosphorus in Lake Okeechobee can contribute to it. And if you start talking about Lake Okeechobee, you start talking about the dike around the lake. And then you start talking about Everglades restoration. You find that everything is interconnected when you start talking about the Everglades and all these water systems, Michael. That's exactly right. Because remember, all of Central and South Florida used to be connected by essentially the Everglades ecosystem. It was just this sheet of shallow, incredibly clean water that flowed all the way down the peninsula. And uh, and so now all of these problems that we have in the in the Everglades ecosystem, whether it's the flocculent glop over in Martin County, or you, you can't breathe at the beach over around Fort Myers, or Florida Bay, you know, having its own sort of collapse, and, and the Everglades itself, where you see 95% of the wading birds are gone. These are all connected. They're all the same problem, as, as well as some of our problems where, you know, we're worried about the drinking water and that we're worried about whether we're going to be able to have development and agriculture in the future. And they're all essentially the same problem of the water isn't right anymore. It's too dirty and it doesn't flow. You well, covered what was connected is now like a puzzle all broken up into pieces that we can't figure out how to fit back together. And again. man keeps inter intersecting right, those right, lines. Right, right. It's very... And it was all done for us. It right. was all... It's, it's the most elaborate water management system in, you know, in America. And, uh, you know, it's like 2,000 miles of levees and canals. You got pumps so powerful that the, the engines had to be cannibalized from nuclear submarines. And that's how we can live here. That's how we can farm here. Um, but it just isn't... It's not sustainable right now. I wanted to go back to the algae crisis. You covered uh, that a fair amount. Mm -hmm. You wrote about that. Walk me through your impressions of it. And just in terms of, like, when you realized what was happening on the Treasure Coast in terms of this thick, blue-green, toxic algae that sort of like oatmeal, you know, tracing its roots. And, and talk to me a little bit about what you found during well, covering all that. it wasn't the first time there's been that kind of crisis on the coast. It's happened before. So it was, I don't think it was a huge surprise. I think what was really bad this time was visually this stuff was just I, that guacamole thick stuff yeah. was really alarming. And as you pointed out in, in the show, um, you had the Senate president it, it happening in his hometown. Right. Um, so you knew, like, this is not going to go quietly away. This is not going to be ignored. This is going to be something. We talk about the politics of the Everglades, and that was, that was, what you mentioned is that the algae crisis took place around the Stewart area of Florida, and mm -hmm. Stewart is represented by a state senator named Joe Negron, who happened to be coming in as the new Senate president, which makes him one of the most powerful political figures in Tallahassee, and as a result of his constituents yelling and screaming about the algae crisis, he made that his number one priority, right. you know, in Tallahassee. And so that led to creating Senate Bill 10, which was this idea of taking farmland, 60,000 acres of farmland south of the lake, building a reservoir so that instead of shooting water from Lake Okeechobee, dirty water east and west where it could form an algae bloom, you send the water south to be cleaned and then down into the Everglades. It sounds simple, but really Senate Bill 10 doesn't really do necessarily what we think it does and it also creates a situation where you then pit an environmentalist against sugar. Michael, you've written a lot about Big Sugar. Is Big Sugar a villain or how do you view Big Sugar? <laughs> well, it's funny. I have uh, I have sort of one of the more I'm kind of ambivalent view about them because parts of it is true, right? There's this, they have this reputation of controlling the legislature. They absolutely do. Republicans and Democrats. Nobody does anything that, that Sugar doesn't want. And uh, they have this reputation as being this kind of environmental scoff law, which is also somewhat true, because they are in the Everglades, they're in the northern Everglades, they block the flow, they like to be dry when the Everglades like to be wet, they do have some, you know, pesticides, they have phosphorus in their, in their, in their fertilizers that are not ideal for the Everglades, but what they will tell you, and what is also true, is that they are much cleaner than they used to be, that they are not the main source of that flocculent glop over in the East 
coast, and uh, and that essentially, you know, it's up to the legislature. It's not, you know, it's not. They're not the ones making the decisions. That uh, that if you're upset about what's happening in the Everglades, that your ire is more properly targeted towards the politicians rather than you know who are doing what Big Sugar wants them to do. But you know, Big, Big Sugar, that's what corporations do. All right. So you had a situation. So again, let's take a step back. You had Lake Okeechobee, which is the second largest lake in the in the continental United States. It's you know filled with with bad phosphorus that comes some of it back pumped over decades from Big Sugar and the surrounding areas south of it, a little bit of it, but most of it flowing from the north from the cattle ranches and orange groves and all the development from Kissimmee, from Orlando, Orlando, all it's the a way sewer south. Pipe for Orlando. Basically, yeah. everything flows down into the lake. So you have this lake filled with phosphorus and nitrogen and all these pollutants that when the gates are opened and the phosphor and the, that water is jetted out east and west, it creates the algae blooms or is a major contributor to it. So why do they have to pump the water out east and west? Well, because they have to keep the lake at a lower level because the dike around the lake is falling apart. So I want to play a part of this because this brings us to the Army Corps of Engineers, who I think everyone universally can agree, or most people end up agreeing, don't, nobody likes the Army Corps of Engineers unless you're married to an Army Corps of Engineer person. And even then, who knows? So let's play, I want to play this I section. I say that. I, I, work with I, I want to play that section for, about the Army Corps of Engineers, and, and let's, let's play that now, and then we'll talk about it. Keeping the water in place? The Herbert Hoover Dyke, a 143-mile earthen berm that encircles the lake. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which operates the 70-year-old dike, determined in 2005 it was on the verge of collapse. And more than a decade later, it remains in a dire state, as Lieutenant Colonel Jennifer Reynolds explained recently to the Florida State Senate. Um, that, that dam is not safe for the people that live and work around the lake. For the 40,000 people at risk who live just south of the dike, the threat seemed all too familiar. In 1928, a hurricane slammed into Lake Okeechobee, causing the lake to overflow its banks and flood the nearby towns of Belle Glade, Pahokee, South Bay, and Cluiston. As many as 3,000 people were killed. Photos from the Florida archives illustrate the aftermath. Homes destroyed, bodies lining the street, rows of makeshift coffins. When the most recent problems with the Herbert Hoover Dyke were discovered, the Corps initiated emergency repairs, but the pace has been gradual, with Congress slow to fund the $1.6 billion project. As of now, the repairs are not expected to be complete until 2025. Where Washington let us down, I would say, is the complete ineptitude of the Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, you can't make it up. Their systems are horrible. The managing of Lake Okeechobee, the dike, that's still going on. I mean, that's a serious uh, issue that needs to be fixed. J.P. Sasser was the longtime mayor of Pahokee, which sits in the shadow of the dike and will be wiped away if it were to breach. I don't blame the Army Corps. They're the Army. They follow orders. You go find out who's giving them the orders, and you say, give them the goddamn order to finish the dike and then fund it. I work very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers. All they care about is doing their job the best to their ability, but they're caught constantly with political infighting. They're told one minute to do this, they're told the next minute to do that. Fund the people, put the money where it needs to go, and let the people do their job and stay the out of the damn middle of it. All right, I want to get your reaction to the Army Corps of Engineers in a second, but let's take a break first, and when we come back, more of our discussion. Get once a year model year-end clearance savings. Now at Rick Case. It's our model year-end clearance sale at Rick Case Volkswagen with our guaranteed lowest clearance prices for your money back. Plus, buy now and you can pay nothing till next year. This week at Rick Case Volkswagen on I-75. It's the Auto Nation 72-hour flash clearance. Model year-end savings will be revealed every 72 hours. Right now, lease a brand new 2017 Honda Civic LX sedan, only $99 a month. Hurry to Auto Nation Honda. The summer sales challenge is almost over. At Edmore Sawgrass Cadillac, these ATS sedans, two fifty nine, XT fives, three thirty nine, and Escalades, eight oh nine. It's the final clearance. Visit EdmoreSawgrassCadillac.com. 
The 2018 VWs are here. The 17s must go. This week at Rick Case, get our guaranteed lowest clearance price. Plus, we'll double your factory warranty to 10 years. Our model year-end clearance sale. This week at Rick Case Volkswagen, America's largest volume dealer. You just saved a woman from being tortured to death. I'd call that a good night's work. Beneath Biscay National Park waters lay silent reminders of real maritime casualties. Voyages that came to a terrifying halt on the park's coral reef. Today, these historic wrecks reveal their secrets to those willing to explore. Six wrecks and a lighthouse comprise the park's Maritime Heritage Trail. Join our partners, learn more about Biscayne National Park and how you can protect this area now and for future generations. Welcome back to Facing. We're talking about my year-long investigation, the Everglades, where politics, money, and race collide. Our guest, Jenny Soledovich, which cover, who covers environmental issues for the Miami Herald, and Michael Grunwald is a writer with Political and the author of the must-read book, The Swamp. When did The Swamp come out, Michael? How long ago was it? Was, uh, 2006. 2006. And a lot has happened with the Everglades since then. We were young then. We were young then. <laughs> All right, so when we, when we went to break, we, were, we showed a little bit about the debate over the Army Corps of Engineers and their handling of the dike around Lake Okeechobee. The Army Corps of Engineers has always been a very, you know, uh, lightning rod sort of group. They try to portray themselves as being apolitical, just engineers doing science. Michael, is that your impression? <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I stumbled into the Everglades through covering the Army Corps of Engineers back when I was at the Washington Post. And they are a super political agency. And remember, they are, you know, they were really America's shock troops in the war against nature. And it really started in 1928. After that hurricane blasted Lake Okeechobee through its dike, the Army Corps was brought in, essentially, to fix the situation. And in the Everglades, 1928 has really been their sort of North Star. They have to make sure that doesn't happen again. So they do not let that lake get tied. And since they don't have the natural storage that the Everglades used to provide, because half the Everglades is gone, it's being farmed or it's being lived on by us, they have to blast that water out of the lake to make sure that they don't have another huge hurricane that uh, now that you have, you know, killed 3,000 people back in 1928 when there was a fraction of the number of people living behind it well, that you have not, now. And that's so they have to get rid of that water, and that's what destroys the estuaries, that's what destroys the Everglades, um, that's what creates all kinds of problems problems because there's essentially no place to store the water. Well, let's not also forget 2005 being Hurricane Katrina, which is the last time the Army Corps of Engineers was in the news, was over the failures of the dike system in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. They did not want to have that happen again, and it was in 2006, immediately after Katrina, that they set these new standards for lower, keeping the lake levels in Lake Okeechobee in Florida low, which has led to all these problems that we're now dealing with. Uh, Jenny, as, as you sort of have covered this issue as well. You know, you look at what the Army Corps of Engineers has done, and you look at the role of, of Big Sugar. A lot of people want to just easily, reflectively go after Big Sugar as being the villain. How do you, when you cover sugar, just the, the reaction that people have to Big Sugar, what do you generally find? Well, I think people uh, place a lot of blame on Big Sugar for sort of their historic role. They have made progress, like Michael said, in cleaning up the, the water, but you can't underestimate their historic role in the pollution of the Everglades and the place they occupy now in the Everglades and, 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 and sort of the the, the um, block to, to restoration. Right. You know, I mean, it's, it's a... Uh, if you take them out of the equation, restoration could probably right. move ahead. But is that easily. realistic? Can you realistically ever take sugar out of the equation? Well, look, I mean, so much of the system is managed for their benefit. Um, and remember, in, 2000, in 2006, Charlie Chris tried. Um, and sugar, you know, in your documentary, sugar was saying, oh, this is so terrible. You know, we can't lose all these jobs in, uh, you know, in the glades. Well, they were willing to sell out in 2006 when it was in their economic interest. At that time, they didn't, you know, they didn't right. care at 
know about those jobs. And a jobs. lot of jobs were lost with mechanization. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's a lot more jobs were lost in mechanization than the 2000. They're not a very big industry. They have incredible clout, but they're not even Florida's largest agricultural industry. They're not nearly as big as those nurseries that provide, you know, sod for suburban lawns and, and palm trees. Well, you, you, you both t sort of touched on the impact to the communities. I just want to play this last soundbite, which touches on a number of things, including health. It's two people who supported the idea of taking land away from the South and two people who oppose it. Let's play this for a second. We live on the Indian River, um, and during the last discharge session, I actually left with my kids and went to Cincinnati to families because you couldn't walk outside of our house without gagging. It smelled so bad. Um, she has breathing issues, and I was just afraid to have my daughter there. So that's one of the reasons that this needs to be resolved. Thank you. We know that toxins and blue-green algae can be absorbed in your bloodstream and give you internal problems. Dr. Stephen Parr is the Director of Emergency Medicine for Martin Health Systems, which runs three hospitals in the Treasure Coast. We know there are ongoing studies examining the relationship between cyanobacteria toxin, blue-green algae toxin, and neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's, ALS, and Parkinson's disease. Since hydrogen sulfide impairs the body's ability to use oxygen, individuals with underlying heart and lung disease are at greater risk of having heart attacks. We had a 50% increase in heart attacks from 2015 to 2016. Uh, that's pretty strong, at least circumstantial evidence. Emotions were just as high among those from the Glades communities. I can't live with taking up jobs of people who, that's the only way they know how to live, and that's just to work the farmland and provide for this nation. Buying that land will not solve the problem that we have before us. So when you're considering all these things, we want you to remember there are people, not fish, not grass, and not another thing, but there are people that live in these communities that you are talking about. Jenny, that, that one little chunk, and there's more on both sides that you'll hear from in the, in, the, in the special, but you have two people who are part of their community, who are concerned, who say we need to move forward, buy land south. You have two people on the other side who are saying, look, our communities are going to be devastated if we lose jobs and land is taken away. We can talk about it as being big business in the mm -hmm. abstract, but it really is comes down to people's lives. Well, it does, and that's, I think, so often in the Everglades restoration conversation, you're right, it is talked about in abstract terms but it really does affect people on the ground and and not that much effort is made in examining those problems I mean um, the when when the uh, reservoir was being debated there were a couple studies done um, on both sides about the jobs lost neither one of them were accurate it would be nice if they went in and, and objectively looked at what jobs would be lost both sides like to play the game the, exactly exactly and um, I mean, you can't underestimate like the um, the mom dealing with the health. I I don't know what the health impacts are. I mean, blue-green algae, as you pointed out in the in the show, they they're they're doing more studies now. Um, they've done some initial ones, but they need to do m more on that. Um, one part that uh, hasn't been addressed is the stuff that happens south of the lake too, and in, in Florida Bay, the fishing guides down there. There's been real economic impacts down there because of um, the, not fresh the, water the being impacts. able to come down. Right, that. right. How do you how do you weigh these competing interests when you've got you know because again you can take it to the thirty thousand foot level and talk about big government and agencies and dollars and cents but then you bring it down to people you have four people just in that clip who care deeply about their community and who are opposed to each other's positions well this is one of these you know public policy always does have sort of winners and losers and there's no question that uh, certainly the communities like Bell Glades which let's face it has not been doing great for the last uh, you know 60 years while the sugar industry has been making billions of dollars um, but they would be a loser from a lot of these Everglades restoration plans, um, while you know, presumably some of these Martin County communities and Florida Bay communities and you know South Florida, the seven million people living in the ecosystem have an interest in a sustainable ecosystem. Part of the decision that was made in 2000, um, back when Everglades restoration passed the Florida legislature unanimously and uh, the U.S. Congress, with only a couple of dissenting votes, was that this idea that we need to 
save this national treasure and do something about this messed up water system in South Florida that is a potential crimp to development and agriculture, that that's in everybody's interest. That if we can get the water right, that sort of Florida is going to thrive in the future. And so while there are technical questions about how to do that, that is supposed to be the North Star that, that Democrats and Republicans and right-wingers and left-wingers and buffalo-wingers, and you know, <laughs> everybody is supposed to agree that that's what we're doing here. You know, it would have been nice if in the process, Senate Bill 10 ended up passing. We only have less than a minute now, but Senate Bill 10 ended up passing. And I think folks on the coast think, and down south, further in the Keys, think this is going to be the savior for them. I'm not sure it's going to be as big a savior as it turned out to be. It didn't deal with a lot of other issues that needed to be addressed, including those, the flow into the lake from the north and the septic tanks. And one thing that I wish it had dealt with for is the concern that about these communities it would have been nice if there was some real economic development money placed in that bill and instead there was a token amount of money very nominal amount of money placed in if you really want to help these communities and they're going to be the losers because there are winners and losers if we want to if we think that the Everglades need to be saved then you have to find a way to compensate those communities and train them and work with them to do something better you right. agree? No totally yeah yeah I do. I think, again, it's like storage is the answer. And uh, that's so that you can hold water in the dry season and not dump it on people and the environment in the wet right. season. We'll be right back after the break. You work hard, and you deserve to sleep even harder. So this Friday through Sunday, Mattress Firm is having a flash sale with incredible Labor Day savings. Get a free adjustable base with select purchases only during Mattress Firm's Labor Day flash sale. Now, Sinai locations allow you to see a primary care doctor, a urologist, or a cardiologist the same or next day. High quality health care you expect at a convenient location. Easy. Now at the Honda Summerbration sales event, you can get a great deal on a Honda Civic and keep things festive all summer long. Your unforgettable summer begins today with a trip to the Honda Summerbration sales event. Hurry in and get a great deal on a Honda Civic from KBB.com's best value brand at your local Honda dealer. Mount Sinai understands that you want convenience. Schedule a same or next day appointment for primary care, cardiology, or urology at a convenient time and location with a name you can trust. It's hard being a smoker. Hmm. I've heard all the lectures. You know, you shouldn't smoke. <laughs> I know all the signs. I've seen all the faces. I know the money it costs me. But that doesn't change the fact that it's hard to quit. Quit your way with Tobacco Free Florida. With free patches, text messaging, emails, phone, group, and web coaching. Call or visit TobaccoFreeFlorida.com. Thanks for joining us. You can follow me on Twitter at Defeaty or email me at jdefeaty at cbs.com. Remember to join us next week on Facing South Florida. I'm Jim Defeaty. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.